So why is temptation necessary? Okay, it's the third session. We'll meditate, reflect on the temptations of Jesus. Right? For the for the third session or third conference, we will reflect on the temptations of Jesus. You know, this uh, story is found in all the three Gospels. And one can uh, speculate that Christian sources have preserved the memory that Jesus was tempted. And that's easy to understand because everybody goes through this experience. But what I want to point out is this, that Mark's version is very short. It has only two verses. It says that he was pushed into the desert and he was he passed for 40 days and 40 nights, tempted there and ministered by the angels. While in the Gospel of Matthew, look, you see how different they are. The Gospel of Matthew has 10, 10 verses, while Luke has 12 verses. 4, 1 to 11, and 1 to 13. The second thing I'd like to point out is that Mark has a very different description of Jesus going to the desert. Mark's version tells us that Jesus was pushed into the desert by the, by the Spirit. Pushed into the desert. The verb used is ekpalo, pushed. I'd like to translate that in Tagalog. Of course, my translation is not the exact uh, meaning of that, but kinaladkan. Kinaladkan siya ng Spirita. He was pushed into the desert. If you look at the version of Matthew and Luke, it's a very gentle. The Spirit led him into the desert. I really prefer the version of, of Mark, that Jesus was pushed into the desert, dragged into the desert, kinalatkan uh, sa desert. And I will explain why that is necessary. Yes, of course, Mark does not have the three temptations. It's very short, two verses. So, I would assume that the sin was developed later by the community. Remember, Mark's version is the earlier version, while Matthew and Luke were later. 15, 20 years difference. So, the intention, the intention of the developing community and how they develop the story is to evoke the climate, the climate of testing and difficulty in which Jesus lived out his faithfulness to the Father that Jesus himself had to be tested. You know, I, I think it's necessary when one has a religious experience, as I, I was saying yesterday, that has to be tested. In other words, was the experience real? Is it authentic or guni-guni? Baka hallucination. So that's the first reason why he had to be tested. And the temptation is really, in the, in the version of Mark, is only one. It is to create doubt in the mind of Jesus about his religious experience. Why? He heard, if it is true that he heard, that he's the beloved son of God. Then, it had to be tested whether it's real. So the devil, if you look at the three temptations in Luke and Matthew, it has only one purpose, to create that doubt. And that's why the devil would always say, really? You are the beloved? Sige nga, tingnan natin. Huh? You're hungry, right? Okay, why don't you change that stone into bread? So the father will not allow you to be hungry, right? Because you're beloved. And then the second one, of course, made inversion in Matthew and Luke, jumping, okay? jumping. And the devil basically saying, okay, really? You're, you really think you're the beloved son? Sige nga, tingnan natin. Lumundag ka nga dyan. Kasi kung talagang beloved ka, your father will say, he 
we left alone, you can get hurt. And the third one, of course, is really? You have a little laugh? Totally, you have? Okay. You see, I can give you all this. Your father will not. So, it's, it's, it's just like Adam and Eve. Uh, the, uh, the temptation of the serpent is to create doubt because sin always begins with doubt. You begin to create doubt and confusion. Once confusion and doubt starts, then it leads to sin. So, we all experience that. So, these are not just moral temptations. They're not just moral temptations. They go deeper than that. The temptations show the fundamental attitude of Jesus toward God. The fundamental attitude of Jesus toward God. That's what's revealed. In other words, he's beginning to see his mission, that he has a purpose. If he's the beloved son of God, what is his purpose? And how is he going to live out this mission? The temptation is seek out your own interest. That's a common thing, you know, for everything that we do. Ano ba akin dyan? Ano ba akin dyan? Meron ako dyan. May 10% ba ako dyan? Do I profit from this? Okay. Or will I faithfully listen to God's word? That's a temptation. That's a choice that he has to make. And how is he going to act? The temptation is, will I be dominating others? Show them I have power? Show them I have authority? Or should I serve them? So you can already see anticipating his conflict with the Pharisees. Because the religious leaders during Jesus' time, of course, is, dominates. They dictate, they dictate who is pure and impure and who can participate in the sacred meal and those who cannot. They decide who can enter the temple and who cannot. They dominate. Will he be like that? Will he dominate or will he serve? And then, will he seek glory for himself? And that is so tempting. And we know that, that we ourselves too, we like to be affirmed, we like to be confirmed, we like to be praised. Okay? Will he seek glory for himself? Or do God's will? Very real temptations. So the memory preserved by his followers leaves no room for doubt. Jesus lived situations of inner darkness, conflict, and struggle throughout his life. You know, if you saw the movie, Ignacio, I think, what's the title of that? The, the Jesuits produced the life of Saint, Saint Ignatius. It's a local production, it's a beautiful one. For me, the best scene, the best scene there was when that Ignatius went through this temptation. But the devil was himself. If you notice, you know, he was, the devil was trying, telling him to throw himself, right? To commit suicide, to kill himself. But the devil was himself. Huh? It was himself. It was Ignatius. So this is that all saints and all of us go through inner darkness, conflict and struggle throughout our life. But what with Jesus, he remained faithful to his father, whom he calls Abba, beginning with the experience of baptism. So he has seen the Spirit descending on him from that open heaven that will never be forgotten, that leaves an imprint in his heart. God's Spirit, which creates and sustains life, which cures and nourishes every living creature, 
has come to fulfill with his life-giving power. And so the Spirit fills him with his power not to judge, not to condemn, or to destroy, but to cure, to liberate from evil spirits and to give life. That is his knowledge and understanding of the Spirit. And that will shape his ministry. So Jesus feels the Spirit moving him so forcefully that his awareness of his life-giving power leads him to cure the sick people of their afflictions. He could feel the power of the Spirit. And that's why when the woman touches the, the hem of his cloak, Jesus, who touched me? He could feel it. He could feel the Spirit coming out of him. So his, his experience of the Spirit is so powerful. All he asks of them, of these people, is faith in the power of God, acting in him and through him. So filled with the good spirit of his father, he is not at all afraid to confront evil spirits. And that's why, you know, he really believes. And the reason why he, he touches the impure is because he believes that goodness is stronger than evil. That goodness can contaminate better than evil. If, good, if evil is contagious, so is goodness. So he touches even all these uh, impure people. So he confronts the evil spirit in order to bring God's mercy to the people who are most defenseless and slain by evil. He can contaminate them with his goodness. He sees the finger of God, or as Matthew says, the spirit of God in this healing. God is there. When he casts out demons, it is the liberating spirit of God acting in him and through him. He really believes that. You remember the story of Jesus being met on the other side of the lake in the Decapolis when he went there for the first time. And he was confronted by a legion, the man who was possessed by a legion. And he drove out the evil spirit and it went to the pigs. The pigs. His victory over Satan is the best sign that God seeks help and liberation for his children. But the temptation of Jesus did not end in the desert. The temptation of Jesus is hinted to us at the end of the story of the temptation in chapter 4 of both Matthew and Luke. And this is how it concluded. After the devil had finished testing Jesus in every possible way, he left him for a while. Other versions, until another time until the next opportunity, until a more opportune time. And when did that happen? At the agony in the garden. That is the greatest temptation of Jesus. What was the temptation? You know, I, I try to imagine the agony in the garden. They must have finished the meal around 9, a, 9 p.m. And so they move to the uh, garden of Gethsemane. And from, let's say, from 9.30 to 10, he started praying. And he had only one prayer. Get this cup out of me. I don't like it. And he was just repeating that prayer for four or five hours. And I would say that around 4 a.m., he finally changed his prayer. How did he change? Not my will, but your will be done. You know, I always tell people, you know, when you pray, expect not changes outside of you, but most likely the change will happen in you. And your prayer will be changed. That's what happened to Jesus. He was, his prayer changed. 
not my will, but your will be done. When he got up from that place, he was already calm and peaceful. He has resigned, but he knew that he would suffer physically, terribly, painfully, but he was at peace when he got up from there. So the temptation was go back to Galilee, as his apostles suggested, lie low, let things come down, and he can resume. But what would be the consequence of that decision? <laughs> the Pharisees and the religious leaders say, look at that guy, he talks too much, okay? He just threatened him, he runs away. And so, who would believe him? A person who is really convinced of what he's saying is willing to die for it. And Jesus is willing to die for the kingdom. You know, Rolf Heiser kept repeating, the passion of Jesus, is it Rolf Heiser? The passion of Jesus is his passion for the kingdom. That is his passion. That brought him to his passion in Calvary. So the very first passion of Jesus is the kingdom. So he was willing to die for that passion. And so he made a decision after hours and hours of praying. And once he has accepted, then he stood up, now resigned, at peace in his heart, in his soul. Even with the realization that he would go through the physical pain and agony. You know, when I was a, a novice, or was I, was I a junior? And we were, I think I was a junior. And in, in the, what is now called Postulancy House. And uh, Father Bolton lived with us. He was one of the staff there. And every now and then, we would watch him in the chapel. He's praying alone, and he was talking to the devil. We just watched him. Because we knew, at least I knew he was talking to the devil because he kept saying, get up, get up, get up, get up. <laughs> he was telling the devil. Because at the end of his life, he became very, very scrupulous. And that is, of course, temptation. And Tadi knows that. Tadi, he would ask permission from the superior. Tadi was the superior. If he can miss morning prayer, you know, praying that very, very. He became so scrupulous. Because I really believe at the moment of death, there is a struggle between goodness and evil, between Satan and the angels. That is the last struggle, the greatest temptation. Should we go this way or should we go that way? That is the greatest temptation that Jesus went to at the agony in the garden. So why is temptation necessary? We cannot deny that we all go through temptation. I ask you this question. What did you discover about yourself in times of temptation? Because when you are tempted, it will show whether you are strong or weak, whether you are honest or dishonest. When you are tempted, uh, when somebody bribes you, okay, do this and I'll give you this, you know, this amount. Whether you accept it or not, it shows and reveals your character. If I accept this, then it shows I am weak and dishonest. If I refuse it, then it shows my character that I am honest, straightforward, and strong. So every temptation reveals the kind of person we are and the kind of character we have. Okay. So it's a good question to ask ourselves. And that's the reason why temptation is necessary. You can recall your moments of temptation and ask yourselves, what did you discover? about yourself in those moments.
Please don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Oblate TV. TV.